I, I think if I had a dollar for every time someone, when they found out that I played table tennis, said that they, oh, yeah, I reckon I'll be able to beat you. We should play. I would, I'll definitely be raking it all in at the moment. <laughs> Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello, fans of Shuklastan, and welcome to our first Monday episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello, how are you? I am very well. Did you have a nice weekend? I did. I did a little Olympic Day, well, post-Olympic Day celebration, because that's when I did my sporty stuff. <laughs> and I got my Team USA Oreos, so it's all good. Can't get better than that. Right. Did you have a good weekend? I had a very lovely weekend. Weather was a little iffy, but we made it work. Excellent. Excellent. So yes, we are doing uh, twice a week episodes from now up to the start of the Tokyo Olympics. Today, we are starting off with table tennis. We are talking with Melissa Tapper at Rio 2016. Uh, Melissa Tapper became the first Australian athlete to participate in both the Olympics and the Paralympics. She has qualified for both once again at Tokyo and at the Olympics. She'll be competing in mixed doubles and team event with Heming Hu. And at uh, the Paralympics, she'll be in the singles. We talked with Melissa about how table tennis works. Take a listen. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us. Table tennis, explain the basics of a match, you know, beyond hitting a ball across a, a, a net and on a table. How, how many, how, how do you win? <laughs> I guess um, I'll, I'll take it back to more so what it involves so the best way to describe table tennis is it needs the speed of a 100 meter sprinter you need the poise of a golfer uh, and you also need the mentality of a chess player so I guess once you put all of those things together it's a very highly complex sport and incredibly tough because you're only just several meters apart from your opponent so it's very confronting as well you're face to face with them so the, I guess the, the biggest aim is though that you need to be able to serve uh, it's very important because if you can't do that you can't cannot start the point and you also need to be able to receive because if you can't put their serve back over then you've straight away lost the point as well so um it's it's an incredibly difficult game i think i think it's one of the world's most difficult games to play but it's incredibly fun and addictive as well and i i reckon that majority of the population has played table tennis at some point in their life right so most people have played I know you're not supposed to say ping pong, but when it's me playing it, it's definitely ping pong, not table tennis. <laughs> and I think that almost makes people think it's easier than it is. Oh, that's just something we play in the basement. But it's so much different when we get to the table tennis elite level. So talk about some of those differences. Yeah, it, that's definitely um, a very common thing that does happen <laughs> that if you've played in your backyard or, you know, in the garage or something like that, that's a whole lot of fun. But <laughs> once you do take it to an international and professional level, it's a, a little bit of a different ball game, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I do find that a lot of people, when they have seen it, whether it's been on YouTube or do see it played in, in real life, that then they're incredibly amazed by what they're seeing. A lot of the time, though, they see clips where the athletes like at the far back of the court and they're hitting these massive forehands and which looks amazing, but it doesn't it's not something that necessarily happens all the time, though, and you're not particularly in a great position if that is where you end up. But if you were to watch table tennis being played live and at, at an, an Olympics, it's incredibly fast. Everyone's very powerful. There's quite a few differences between the male and the female matches, but they're both amazing to watch. And I, I think if I had a dollar for every time someone, when they found out that I played table tennis, said that they, oh, yeah, I reckon I'll be able to beat you. We should play. I would, I would definitely be raking it all in at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what are those differences between the men's and the women's game? Uh, between the male and females? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so males tend to be more powerful. Um, so rallies can be shorter because they're sort of hitting the ball harder to get past their opponents. Uh, whereas you watch the the female game, it's not as much power, but they're insanely quick um, and the rallies are quite long. So some of the rallies, particularly the, yeah, in the female side, are absolutely epic with how, how fast they are and how long the rally will go for. But, yeah, both still definitely amazing to watch. So for Tokyo, you're playing mixed doubles. How Do you get, like, the best of both games then in one match? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good way of looking at it. It's <laughs> it, it can be difficult because each, each set you have to alternate who you receive and play to. So there will be one set the, the male will play to me and then the next set the female will play to me. So you keep alternating. And there can be a bit of strategy in terms of when you start the match and you find out who whoever gets to serve gets to choose whether they serve or not. And then you can also have strategy around with the first set who everyone receives from. So, yeah, there's a bit that goes into it. But mixed doubles is a lot of fun. My doubles partner and I, Heming, have played since we were juniors and – yeah, it's it's really nice if you're going to be out there on the world stage. It's nice to have someone by your side and enjoy yourself while you're doing it. I have a quick question on scoring because so many of the terms of table tennis borrow from regular tennis, but the scoring looks very different to me. So how how do you win a point, win a set, win the match? Yeah, yeah. So a set is played up to 11. Uh, and so it's like one point each time every athlete gets two serves though so you keep alternating every two serves but if it gets to 10 all then you've hit juice and then you get go by one serve each until someone wins by two points uh and to win a match it's best of seven sets so the first one to win four sets so these can go pretty long can't they yeah 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 um matches can go in you know plus one hour type dependent upon the styles as well that are playing. There's, if anyone knows of like a defensive style, so it's like a, a chopper. Um, if it's a chopper via chopper then or defensive um, versus defensive, then you're looking at quite a long match ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> so how do those different styles look to the casual viewer? What would be a chopper? So a chopper... Yeah, is what you would call defensive. So they're just always, they just keep getting the ball back regardless of how hard or where the other person is playing them. Um, Very impressive to watch. Whereas an attacker, you know, takes on the attacking form, sort of hits a bit harder, moves what looks like faster. Yeah, so it's a good combination to sort of see a little bit of both. Yeah. Now, does the ball spin? Like, can you put spin on on the ball? <laughs> a, a crazy amount of spin, um, <laughs> which makes it really fun, actually. Someone who hasn't played table tennis before, the first thing I enjoy doing is throwing a bit of spin because then they sort of realize, oh, okay, what, what just happened there? And it, it is another element that you have to consider in the split of a second to make a decision on how to play it back as well. So like, you know how I was saying our sport is really difficult. <laughs> it has so many different variations in there and yeah, and so much different spin. So you could have backspin, topspin, side spin. Yeah. And you got to be able to see it and then account in your brain how you're supposed to play it back. So there's a lot going on in a very short space of time. <laughs> so speaking of spin, I noticed that the paddle has two different colors depending on what side so you've got the red side and the black side what does that what's all what's that all about yep so you have to have two you have to have a red and a black but the way that the rubber is that you have can be made up however you like so you can have smooth rubber so that's where you can generate a lot of different types of spin um, when you play a stroke but you can also have what's called a pimple and that is quite common, I guess, for someone who may have brought 
their bat from like a sports store or, you know, um, and they got like the little dimples in, in the side. Yeah. So they, they actually change the spin when you're, when you're playing to them. And the confusing part is you can have three different lengths of them. So you can have short, medium and long, and they will all play a different role in the kind of spin that they will produce back. So it, it's quite complicated, but you can you could have a bat that has two smooth rubbers. You could have one that has two um, pimple. One could be a short pimple and a medium pimple. One could be a smooth rubber with a long pimple. It, it's really up to the athlete, their playing style as to how they make their bat. But yeah, again, there's a whole lot that goes into it. Yeah. So are you spinning the paddle mid point? I would say no. So like probably 98% of the population doesn't. They they will hold it. Um, they'll have one rubber for their forehand, run rubber for their backhand. But one of the top Australian females, actually, she is incredible. She plays with a long pimple one side and a smooth rubber on the other side, but she will twiddle during a point dependent upon what she wants to play back with it. So uh, I think the talent that she possesses to be able to do that is incredible. But um, you don't really see very many ever around the world that are able to do that. Why does one have to be red and one has to be black? Is that just the rules? Um, in terms of why the those colours, I'm not sure. <laughs> but you need to be able to, uh, the athletes need to be able to distinguish between each side. So, for example, how I'm saying that there is a pimple rubber and it, it changes the spin. So you need to be able to identify when they've played with that rubber and when they've played with the other one. Because if you have two black rubbers, for example, and they have two different rubbers, like it's impossible to know what they've just played with. So, yeah, does that if that makes sense? Like, <laughs> So it's, it's kind of like, oh, I see they're playing with their red side or they just hit with the red side. So I know how to kind of counteract that. I know how to hit it back. Yeah, yeah. So so if, for example, long pimple, it's a, an amazing rubber. So if I was to play top spin to a long pimple rubber, they play it back with that, it'll give me back back spin. So it reverses the spin that I give. So if I'm playing a match against someone that has that and they twiddle, they may have that on the red side and smooth rubber on the black side. So I top spinning, they're playing with the black. So it's like, okay, okay, uh, the red rubber, all right, backspin. I know that I can play it back with back, like push it back. So if you don't have that, then you'd you'd actually have no idea what what's going on. <laughs> okay, so besides twiddle, what other terms would we hear the announcers use? Lob. Like you can be back lobbing, you can be back smashing. Yeah. On the spot, so I'm not like really sure now. <laughs> yeah, I know. So it sounds like a lot of tennis terms will still be used in table tennis as well. Yeah, very yeah, quite similar. Yep. Yep. So do you have like twenty five paddles in different configurations? <laughs> no. No. I, I've got I got three. Okay. So do you it like okay, I, I like this length of pimple and this I I don't even this smooth side <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've got twiddles going through my head <laughs> I, I don't know how anymore. long are your pimples <laughs> <laughs> so I I don't play with pimples I play smooth rubber both sides so I have three three bats that are made up um, I have my main playing bat and then two spare bats but they're they're configured exactly the same so the theory behind that is I have my main one that, that I like, but something may happen to that. I may play a forehand, hit the side of the table and split my rubber before a match. So then I'll have to go to one of my spare. Um, and you don't want it to be any different because it wants, you want it to feel like the one you always play with. Yeah. So I've, I've got the same racket basically made up three times. Can you put anything on your hands? Because I would assume your, your, your paddle hand gets very sweaty. Mm, um, I mean, you could, mine, it doesn't get that sweaty though, that it feels like it's going to fling, my bat's going to fling out of it or anything. <laughs> um, but we, a lot of players have a habit of walking to the table and wiping their hand, you know, close to the net or at the back of the table and it takes off the sweat. 
but we've kind of had to retrain our brains because of COVID. You can't be touching the table like that anymore. So it's now trying to figure out something else to do with your hand to get rid of the sweat. So <laughs> You have, to, you have to hang the towel off your pants like the American it, football players do. Is, yeah, yeah, that's, that's not a bad idea, actually. <laughs> Let's talk about the table for a second, because I, I've been wanting to talk to a table tennis player for like a year and a half, ever since I went to the sporting goods store. And they had three different types of table tops available and the you could feel the quality but i couldn't i didn't understand what the different quality meant so at the elite level like what is that surface of the table like yeah so the table surface varies depending upon the brand and which one that you're using so you can have one that feels quite grippy and then that means the ball's going to hit it and then basically just stop and go straight up so that's what you consider a slow table and then it will range from that to then one that's quite shiny and the ball will just skid straight through and that'll be quite fast. So depending upon which tournament you're at, uh, what event it is, what, what sponsor the tournament has is to what table is going to be used. So, yeah, you need to be able to adapt to everything, really. <laughs> will the table and the ball change as either the tournament progresses or the, the single match progresses? No, no. So th for an entire tournament, the table and the ball will be exactly the same. And as you're playing on that table, will it change? You know, does, you know, after you've been on it for half an hour, it gets hot or it softens up or any sort of weird um, changes along the way? Not, not necessarily. You probably, you can potentially notice a little bit of change from the table surface from the beginning of the tournament to the end though maybe just the slight little change because generally at a major event as well they'll bring in brand new tables that haven't been used but then once they've been practiced on and trained on and then played on the surface will alter maybe just slightly and it may not be as slow for example like it may not group it just as much so come the back end of the week you may see that it's the ball sort of moves through a bit more normal <laughs> but yeah other than that though not not too much of a change do you know what they're using table wise at tokyo uh they've got sanai tables quite sim similar to what we had in rio okay and is that a fast table or a slow table or it's sort of probably mid it's a bit it's a bit slower than what i i normally train on but it's definitely not the slowest table I've ever played on. So yeah, it's sort of mid-range, I'd say. <laughs> what kind of shoes are you wearing? They're considered an indoor shoe. So they're like got a, a thin sole, but enough for like a bit of stability. Yeah, I guess because we need to be at it, we have to be quite agile and move laterally laterally yeah quite <laughs> quite quickly um so yeah they're an indoor shoe but sort of quite thin so they're they're not as bulky as a tennis shoe though for example yeah speaking of moving laterally you have crazy amounts of hand-eye coordination and agility to play this what do you do to train that uh, I guess the best improvements you can do are always on court. So you can either do um, like set up a drill with your partner. So then they'll block certain positions. You can help it by another form of training that's called multi-ball. So the coach will stand at the side of the table and have like a big box full of balls and then they can just feed it. So it doesn't matter if you get the ball on or not for example, because a, a whole new ball will be fed to you and you can play around with the speed of that. So you can do a pace that's quicker than what you'll actually get and you can do a pace that's slower um, and so forth. But that's a good way to be able to train speed and movement. But then also, obviously, in the gym, yeah, I do quite a, quite a bit of work as well in terms of strength and then plyometric training to get a little bit faster as well. How do you and your doubles partner stay out of each other's way? Because that's the fun <laughs> part about the doubles. It's just like, it's your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we don't always stay out of each other's way. <laughs> so our our combination is I'm I'm left-handed and Hemming's right-handed. So it's quite ideal for doubles the way that it's set up that you know we're sort of positioned to be able to cover the whole table and not ru- have to run around one another. But yeah, there's still at times you can get caught out and there's some funny things that end up happening trying to get out of the way. <laughs> so in your partnership, are you big talkers? Do you communicate a lot during the match or is there very subtle? How do you work together? Yeah, we communicate quite well, probably just very briefly between most points, whether you know, whether it's a celebration and a bit of encouragement of something that we did really well or whether it be tactically for the next point what are we going to try and do or what's the next person person sort of need to be prepared for because what we think might come back but yeah you don't have a whole lot of time so it's just very short and precise and then on on to the next ball but yeah I, I remember playing in 2018 in the Commonwealth Games that were on the Gold Coast in Australia with Hemming and we had an awesome match against Singapore and like yeah, I just remember after every point, the the rallies were just awesome that we were just celebrating and like it was, yeah, it's a, it's a really nice uh, environment and to, I guess to play doubles and be out there with someone else is really fun. So Paralympics, because you did both in Rio, are you trying again to do both for Tokyo? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I, I qualified my spot on the Olympics uh, two two weeks ago now. Um, and that means that I'll head over for the Olympics and then I'll stay in Tokyo during, um, until the Paralympics begin. Are there any, besides classifications, is there any difference in the para game? No. So yeah, the, the only differences are dependent upon the classification of what you are to, I guess, what, uh, limitations are placed on you within the match. So for example, I'm a class 10. So my disability, um, I've got brachial plexus in my right arm. So I can't, I don't have much, uh, I don't have much wrist movement, finger movement. So it's my serve. Um, so when I go to serve, I can't do what's considered a legal serve, which is palm open like this. I can't do that. So I just put the ball in my right hand and throw it up and then serve. But then after that, everything else is the same. But then if you were to look at some of the the athletes that are in wheelchairs, so wheelchairs, though, is serve rules is completely different to the athletes that are standing. So you have the table and you can only serve, has to go straight off the end of the table. So you can't play the angles. So if it bounces off the side of the table, it's considered a fault. But... Yeah, so it has to go regardless, straight off the end. Yep. So when you reached the elite level of Olympic play, was there any controversy in that you weren't serving what was considered a legal serve? How did that develop in terms of your eligibility? Yeah, to be honest with you, everywhere's been very good with it. (laughs) Um, So in in the Paralympic world, I got I I have like a little card that has my exemption on it, and internationally, when I've competed in able-bodied events, no one has ever um yeah kicked up issue. about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, occasionally an umpire may not be aware, and they will be like thinking about faulting me, but then either explaining or showing then the the card and then and then it's fine so yeah <laughs> okay now you mentioned the umpires what what's the relationship between players and umpires what's allowed for players to argue in at points or <laughs> or that that whole behavioral uh, complex <laughs> yeah there, there's definitely a few athletes that love a good umpire argument um <laughs> i don't know that they often win though because you can still get carded, you can be yellow carded, then red carded, and then be out of out of the event. But generally, um, yeah, I I think umpire, umpires do a great job. And then if there's any discussion over something, the the referee will come in as well. But 
yeah, it's definitely always provides some good entertainment when some athletes start deciding to question the umpire's decisions. <laughs> are, are there any other officials like like linesmen or anything to see if it bounced on the table or is that pretty much the umpire can see it all? Like having a bit of Hawkeye so he can replay a point to see. <laughs> um, no, no, we uh, we don't have uh, anything like that that I'm aware of, but you never know. Tokyo might bring something out, out like that. The only time, though, in Paralympic sport, you may have a ball boy. So at the end of each point, they might collect the ball and bring it back. But, yeah, other than that, you've just got the two athletes and then the two umpires out on court. I wanted to ask about Rio, just oh, how, yeah. how, how is that experience, both the Olympics and the Paralympics? Yeah, it was, a, it was amazing. It was my first Olympic experience. My, um, my dad and my father-in-law headed over for it. So I had them up in the stands amongst a sea of 5,000 Brazilians. So that was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> my dad thought it was a fun game to try and cheer louder than them. But I mean, two people to 5,000 was pretty difficult. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was absolutely awesome. Then I flew home for two and a half weeks. And then I flew back for the, the Paralympics. But again, my dad did the same thing. He flew back for for both as well. So <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, was, it was busy. It was good. It was a whole lot of fun. Tokyo was going to be potentially a much better scenario because the flight is a lot closer back to Australia. Time difference is minimal, but yeah, however, I'm going to have to stay in Japan now in in between the two, but yeah, that'll be fun. (laughs) So we have gotten word that there will be some fans allowed Mm. at Tokyo and I would expect Japan to be a pretty big table tennis hub. So what are you expecting from, from Tokyo? Yeah, I th- I think that was probably one of the biggest things for me as well. Originally thinking about Tokyo, that the crowd and that environment would be absolutely amazing because table tennis is probably one of their main sports as well. And I've been to Japan a couple of times for um, World Cup events and the the crowds that they draw in and and the enthusiasm and the way they go about their cheering and stuff is absolutely awesome. Like it's an awesome at- atmosphere. So I I was a little surprised that there were going to be uh, spectators, but nonetheless, I think that it, that adds to giving a little bit more of the experience to an Olympic Games, which which will be nice. And also for our sport that generally, I guess, in terms of crowds and everything like that, doesn't always get the biggest crowds, but I think in Tokyo where we're going to do okay, which is really exciting. Okay. I want to know, have you ever just gotten clocked right between the eyes with the ball? Yeah. Yeah. The ball. Sometimes I hit myself with my bat in the head. I clip my knee. Don't even ask me how I do that. But yeah, I, it only happened just a couple of weeks ago as well. And I was like, I'm 31 and I still managed to hit myself in the head. So we're doing well. <laughs> I feel better now. (laughs) Thank you so much, Melissa. You can follow Melissa on Facebook, Insta, and Twitter at Millie Tapper. That's Millie with a Y. And then her website is MelissaTapper.com. You know, we only had it for half an hour, but we could have done like two hours with, with Millie. So many table tennis questions. And so many things I don't know how to do on table tennis. Right. Well, and I'm kind of meant to take a screenshot of this because I don't know if she noticed, but I noticed that when she started talking about pimples on the on the, the bat, both of our eyes just got big and we turned into like 12-year-olds pre, pre-teens who <laughs> just wanted to laugh about pimples on a paddle. I mean, this is why we do the show. We get so excited about all these little nuances that they never talk about on the the TV broadcasts. And I think viewers want that stuff. I think they want to know about the paddle. I think they want to know twiddle. I think they want to know what the shoes are like because that makes it more interesting. It makes it not just, wow, they hit that ball real hard. It gives it some depth 
and flavor. And I, I wish the announcers would get into it, which when we've been watching here in the U.S., we've been watching swimming and diving and both Rowdy Gaines and Cynthia Potter are really good at doing both. Yes, I, I will say that I feel like the announcing is taking a step up because the wrestling trials were the same. The person who was the expert uh, color commentary was was doing a great job about saying why points were being scored because that's something you don't understand. So, But not talking over your head. Right, right. I, I like the balance of you need to explain to me, but not be too, we're demanding a lot, but not be too repetitive so the people who do know the sport aren't like, oh no, going through this again, but also be excited for the athletes. It is, it is hard. I'm not saying it's not hard, but I think Cynthia Potter, who does the diving in the U.S., is one of the best at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that NBC has learned, and I, I'm curious to hear what, what it's like in other countries, but because it very much used to be the repetitive, e either they said nothing, so you didn't know anything about what you were looking at, or it was so basic that any kind of, even casual fan, knew what they were doing, and repetitive in a way that was just kind of a turnoff. But I think they're doing better in educating broadcasters or training broadcasters in how to announce in a way that's informative and and kind of spontaneous in a sense of little moments to look for. And it, it is getting better, but I, I mean, we still do the show because there are things that we're curious about that I think that once we start talking with an athlete, we're like, oh, what about this? And it kind of preps us for going in to watch and things to look for. And yet we still can't get decent gymnastics announcers. I'll just have to watch the stream with the, uh, the British announcer. Oh, right, right. That'll be good. So much better. You noticed something about the Australian teams as they get announced for each sport that is very cool on, in a silver fern kind of way. Yes. So... I had been seeing several pictures from the Australian Olympic Committee on Instagram, and they give them a kimono style robe in the Australian team colors. And so they've got this this green robe with yellow trim, and they take a picture of the new Australian Olympic team members with a giant Qantas plane ticket to Tokyo, like those giant checks that you get at an event. Which is awesome. Which is great. So they've got the robe and the ticket, which is just, I think it's the same ticket. I don't think each of them are actually getting these giant tickets. <laughs> I think it's a prop, like a photo booth. But even if it's a prop, it's a, it's a great photo. And they do all get to keep the robes, clearly. Very cool. Very cool. As we love Kit. This is an even better part of Kit. Exactly. Uh, before we move on to our uh team keep the flame alive news uh, we'd like to thank our patreon patrons who support the show financially and help keep us going if you value what the show does for you check out our patreon site that's patreon.com slash flame alive pod we've got different levels and different uh, bonus gifts for our supporters uh, the money we earn from patreon helps support the show ongoing but also in the run-up to beijing where we will have on the ground coverage we also love it if you could tell a friend about the show because we love finding more of our people. Thank you so much for your support. We can't do this show without you. Welcome to Shook Flipped On. Yes, time to keep uh, check in with our past guests who are citizens of our country, Shook Flipped On. Starting off with bobsledder Lauren Gibbs, who went up to Carmel, California to, to uh, talk with her teammate, Nick Cunningham, and his track team. When Shook Flastani's collide. I know, that's very cool. Canada's chef de mission, Marnie McBean, was on Xander's podcast. And so Xander is a little kid on doing the podcast, and it's really sweet. So we'll have a link to the YouTube video of that. And also in Canada, uh, race walker Evan Dumphy shattered the Canadian record for both the 5,000 and 10,000 meter race walks. And and it's pretty incredible how much he shattered these by. The, the 5K race walk record was 1845, and he did it in 1839.08. So congratulations, Evan. It looked like it was a tough one, but man, you are getting primed in the run up to Tokyo. Or the walk up to Tokyo for you. 
para dressage athlete Sydney Collier competed at the Try On Para Equestrian event, and in her three events, she did really well. Looking good. Uh, the team announcement is July 5th. So fingers crossed. So good luck, Sydney. Yes. Our news from uh, Tokyo 2020, Kyoto News, reported that on the day of the opening ceremonies, the Japanese Air Force's Blue Impulse Air Air Aerobatics team is set to trace the five Olympic rings in the sky with colored smoke. So that team also gave performances at the opening ceremonies of the 1964 Olympics and the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano. Very excited about that. The Athletes' Village was opened to the media in the last week. So if you've seen pictures of the rooms or little videos, uh, you can see the cardboard beds. I had forgotten about those. The card, Yeah, the beds made of cardboard that can be recycled. <laughs> so hopefully they're comfortable. I, I'm very curious to hear what athletes think of those. And I hope they have the add-on piece for the basketball players. Exactly. All live sites are scrapped, so there were going to be several sites throughout the, the city in parks where they'd put big screens up so that people could gather together and watch the events together outside, but those have all been discontinued. The organizing committee has decided to cancel those to uh, prevent the spread of COVID, so uh, several of those have been turned into mass vaccination sites already. And then the last of the playbooks have been released. Now, these all the, are the, the manuals that will guide different uh, segments of the Olympics and Paralympics. It's not the family. It's going to like the attendees who are the going population. To be, yeah. Who will be there. So these were for the workforce, the Olympic and Paralympic family, the marketers and the international federations. So don't come. Hmm? Was it was the playbook just a single sentence that said don't come? No, <laughs> you cannot tell the Olympic family not to come. It's like Aunt Joanne is going to show up at the wedding no matter what, <laughs> invitation or not. Well, they are hoping that Aunt Joanne does not come. <laughs> Same with your, your family, your immediate family. Don't come. Some of the things, they're, they're all quite similar. The, a couple of weeks ago, the first round of the last version of playbooks was released and there there's not much different in these they did say that border measures it, they they reserve the right to make changes for countermeasures in the future and they could strengthen borders if if things get worse and the government of Japan could implement additional restrictions on games participants from designated countries if that was necessary to do. So that's a little interesting tidbit. The other thing I thought was really interesting was that they do say, make sure you have enough, you have access to enough masks to last throughout your stay in Japan. Your responsible organization is responsible for providing you with masks. The first time I noticed this was in the Olympic and Paralympic family playbook. And then it was just kind of repeated in the other ones. But I thought, you know, the people in the Olympic family, well, not to mention the fact that everybody probably already has a whole wardrobe of masks that they should just pack them all. But I would think that the people who are in members of the IOC would have the means to provide their own masks. I mean, is you this part think. of their DM per diem? You know, that crazy expensive per diem that they get? Right. And so many of these people are prominent public figures in some way, business leaders or diplomats or government officials or in various countries, royalties, that they've been making public appearances. Mm -hmm. So you would think they would already have a mask to match each suit. Right. I, I do kind of wonder if there's going to be an element of, oh, we need branded masks. And so... The IOC may provide the IOC members with uh, an Olympic branded mask. The Paralympic Committee could provide the their board members with Paralympic masks. Uh, I don't know. Will they be? I mean, I've been to graduations where I get the school logoed mask. Oh, you do? Oh, t yes. I've got a few of those from the. <laughs> 
which, you know, I was grateful to be able to go to the graduation and a bonus, you get a mask with the school logo. So I think if a high school can pull this off, the IOC could pull it off. Right. And, but, but then, yeah, would you want, would the IOC want Olympic branded masks for every event? Or are they going to say, well, you know, the International Federation, you come up with something. But it would be a way to identify, like if you were an athlete and you had the athletics mask on, or you had the gymnastics mask on. I mean, somebody might be able to look at you and go, you might be a gymnast because you're all of 4'10", but you never know. I mean, generally, you're going to recognize the gymnast versus the Basketball. weightlifters <laughs> or <laughs> basketball players. <laughs> And I mean, all the, certainly Team USA has been selling masks for months. Right. You know, branded masks. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Did you notice if they had branded masks at the different trials? I, You know, I did not notice. I have not noticed that. Which probably means that they didn't. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that at, at uh, Tokyo and see what they do. Well, on that note, that will do it for this episode. Let us know what you think of table tennis. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. We're Flame Alive Pod on Twitter and Insta. And keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. Join us on Thursday for another exciting show as we go out to music by Archdale. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. now.